The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250.
I was cutting out the copper. This was last week. I think it was like a Thursday. I was cutting out copper for him. I had a couple big boxes full of copper for him. And he said, you know what? You can have that. I'm like, what? He said, you can, you can have that. You cut it out, you can have it. Took it this Saturday. Took it to the uh, um. Omni source. <laughs> Almost out of New Haven. Took it to Omni source. Two hundred eighty-one dollars worth of copper. Wow. Yeah. All I had was, all I had to do was come up with like it was two eighty-one, so I had like seventy dollars to come up with. Well, I had that. So God bless me. Came out, called the man. He came out with the glass that same Saturday, yesterday, put it in. 20 minutes. Took him 20 minutes to put it in. 20 minutes. But the Lord blessed me. Man, the way God moves, you know. The way God moves. Some people are waiting on a big lump sum of money. He don't move. Like, he probably don't move like that. But I just thank God that he put it on my boss's heart for him to say, you know what? You can just have that. Because he was taking it all. So I just thank God the way he moves, you know. It's awesome. So I thank God for that. So anybody else? Testimonies, praise reports. Okay. So we're going to get right into the devotional. And as always, the devotional is coming out of uh, Jesus Calling. It's a devotional book. And this book was written as if the Lord is speaking directly to us. So, today's devotional, it says, Thank me for the glorious gift of my spirit. This is like priming the pump of a well. As you bring me the sacrifice of thanksgiving, regardless of your feelings, my spirit is able to work more freely within you. This produces more thankfulness and more freedom until you are overflowing with gratitude. I shower blessings on you daily, but sometimes you don't perceive them. When your mind is stuck on a negative focus, you see neither me nor my gifts. In faith, thank me for whatever is preoccupying your mind. This will clear the blockage so that you can find me. Amen? Amen. 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 We thank God for that. Keep our minds focused on him. At all times. At all times. Amen. Well, now I'm ready to sing praises to my king. Are you? Amen. Amen. He, he just Oh, 
My name's Rod Penrod, and uh, I've known, uh, known uh, some of you, I, I knew Shirley years and years ago, we used to go to church together at Lake Avenue, if you remember those days. Uh, how many of you were around there? I think Alan, is that right? Um, Ron. Ron? Lake Avenue. Yeah, Lake Avenue Nazarene. Yeah, Kim, Kim and I used to, to go there before it became Grace Point, and they moved, moved uh, over there on, uh, off of 469. Currently, uh, I'm in Bern, and uh, at the, what I do is I'm a, I'm a uh, sports evangelist. I do sports, uh, sports evangelism, and, and that's kind of different. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, a unique ministry, and uh, I really enjoy doing that. Um, it seems to be my calling in, is in evangelism. So well, I've been doing that since actually 
the way back in 1999, we started a basketball program at uh, at uh, at uh, what was Lake Avenue, and uh, they thought we'd have maybe 40, 50 kids that sign up to play basketball. Turned out we had 147, and that was a lot. Okay, and then uh, the next year we had over 200, and then. When I, when I left there, they were running, uh, we had a, a hundred cheerleaders and 200 basketball players when we were at Grace Points. So that was a bunch. That was a bunch. Um, and and uh, I've always enjoyed that, uh, that way because he, most people, when they accept Christ as their Savior, they're between the ages of 5 and 15. That's when most people come to, to the Lord. So that's um, kind of what... I, I, I've always enjoyed working with those, those age kids. And now I even, we, we even have a program. We go all the way up to uh, my oldest one uh, was 61 this year in our sports program. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> so a lot of people say, what in the world is a sports pastor? You know, and I used to tell people, well, I, I get people together, you know, like yourselves, and I run them through rigorous exercises until they cry out to the Lord to save them, right? <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and, and we, you know, but that's not really what, what we do. We, we, I just set up, you know, community sports programs that we can connect to the community. And, and that's what I've been doing since, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Winnie the Pooh? You know, the Winnie the Pooh stories, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the characters in Winnie the Pooh is Tigger. And Tigger would say, the wonderful thing about Tiggers is that I'm the only one, okay? That's kind of what a sports pastor is, too. I think I'm the only one on the district that's a sports pastor. You know, that not too many people uh, know what that is. And so I get a lot of, what do you do, you know? Uh, but I really, I really enjoy that. And uh, so I set up leagues. We've done soccer. We've done basketball and cheerleading. My favorite is flag football and cheerleading. And then we just started a new thing called archery tag. Now, that does, that, doesn't that sound fun, archery tag? Because, you know, when you're shooting bows, and you're shooting with bows, you're shooting arrows at each other. All right? And, and the thing about archery tag is when you get hit, you really know that you're out, right? <laughs> I guess I'm out. No. But they have phone tips on them. And, and we have referees that can tell if a person, you know, we have numbers on the jerseys, you know, you know, three got hit or four caught an arrow. You get one point for hitting somebody on the opposite side. You get three points uh, for catching an arrow. And so um, we have kids from sixth grade. My youngest one is, was 10. My oldest one was 61. So we got, and we have different teams. We've, and you play it kind of like dodgeball. You guys familiar with dodgeball? You've seen dodgeball you throw? And it's, it's played like that. You've got four quarters of five minutes, and that's what, that's what we do. Well, in all of our sports programs, we have a time of devotions with the kids and a time of study as well um, with, with uh, the players. And that's when we tell them about Jesus. Um, and as I said, most people respond to the gospel between the ages of 5 and, and 15. And, and the older we get, you know, the, the harder it is for people to understand or appreciate or have faith that is needed because life has kind of beat them down, right? Um, but uh, yesterday we just finished our tournament, um, the Aquaman won, and, and, uh, and we had a great time. Um, over half the players that are in our sports programs are outside the church. So, uh, but what I wanted to talk to you about, coming from sports and that kind of thing, we try to really create an atmosphere where people feel comfortable. And they don't feel like, oh, you know, I'm going to go to church. You know, I might step into the church and burst into flames, you know. Uh, but, but that's, you know, we want people to feel comfortable. So we try to create an atmosphere where the parents come and they cheer their kids on and they watch it. They know where the bathrooms are. They, they come into the church. They have, you know, we do everything from, from concessions. I've got two of my concessions ladies here today, you know. Uh, Melissa and my wife, they run concessions for, for archery tag. And some of the best connections that are made are made right with the concessions people because they come in, they get their, their pop and their snack and, uh, and, and uh, maybe a walking taco or something, you know. But they build relationships throughout the season. They get connected. And so that's kind of what we like, what we do. Um, 
years ago, there was a Gallup poll that said that 75% of all people are involved in sports some way. Now, I found out here that, that uh, <clears throat> he plays football. And he's related to Rod Woodson, right? And, and uh, another football player that made it to the NFL, uh, and a couple of them. And uh, so, you know, 75% of all people at some time are connected to sports in some way. So it's a good uh, vehicle to use to connect with people. Um, and maybe some of you, uh, you know, when you're growing up, you played, played ball or, or, or skip rope or something, but you're involved in some kind of activity and, and uh, it's good to continue those activities. But uh, one thing about sports is, in most cases, it's a team sport, right? There are a few exceptions. You know, you run, you run uh, cross country. That's a team sport, yes, but you kinda, it, it's kind of a, an individual thing, too, or track as well. But today I want to talk about evangelism as a team sport, okay? Evangelism is a team sport. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7 said that I planted a seed. Apollos watered it. But God has made it happen. He's the one that's making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Now he's saying it didn't matter who gets the credit because it's God who does the work. And that's true. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's March Madness. Anybody watching basketball? Do you like? Okay, you're watching basketball, March Madness. I want to take this opportunity. To, I don't watch a lot of basketball. Um, I, I, I watch football, occasionally NASCAR, but even, in my opinion, that's kind of been ruined. <laughs> but anyway. Um, but uh, in the NAIA, which is the uh, uh, Christian College uh, basketball that they're having, I just wanted to take this opportunity to point out that Grace College from Warsaw, where I went to college, beat Olivet and knocked them up, okay? Olivet is the Nazarene University that we're, our district is. And all of my pastors, my associate staff members, they, you know, three, three, I think three of them went to Olivet. All right, so I sent them a little um, uh, email that pointed out that grace wins every time. And that's true, and it's biblical, right? Grace wins every time. <laughs> and, and so I pointed out that, that Grace College defeated Olivet, who were rated number two, and grace was only seven, so it was an upset. So they went on, and, and, and they get to go and play further into the tournament, okay? <laughs> but evangelism is a, is a team sport. No one is solely responsible for leading someone else to the Lord, right? Um, God uses all of our lives and all of our unique personalities to have a connection with different people, right? And oftentimes it's through our prayer that people get saved. A declaratory prayer for our loved ones and our family and our and and uh, our neighbors, these seasons of prayer are essential in winning others to Christ. And James five tells us, it says that prayer is a religious person is powerful of a religious person is powerful and effective. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything in accordance to His will. He will hear us. First John five fourteen says that uh, that that's what it says in First John five fourteen. Excuse me. In Second Peter three nine it says that God is delaying His judgment according to His will because He doesn't want anyone to perish. The Bible tells us that He's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. He's giving everybody as much opportunity as they as he can so they can come to know him as his pers- as their personal savior. Okay? I've been praying for my, a son-in-law for a very long time. And uh, he's had a pretty rough upbringing. And and Pastor Kevin told me the other day he said, "You know, Rod, he said 
you know, he didn't get where he's at. Robert didn't get to where he's at overnight. It's going to take a very long time for those barriers to come down. He didn't have parents. Mother was a meth addict. <clears throat> Dad was a outlaw biker. Didn't raised, bounced around from uh, from foster home to foster home, and didn't really have parents that set any kind of example for him. And he's very hardened, very untrusting of other people. Doesn't connect with other people well because of the upbringing that he had. He would have to steal. Um, to get enough money to feed him and his brothers because his mom was blowing whatever money they had on meth. So <clears throat> I've been praying for a very long time for him and, and for my daughter to turn back to God because she at one time uh, uh, knew the Lord. And, and now she's kind of walked away and, and they're living, um, not walking with the Lord. And I know he's not saved. In fact, he's said he doesn't want anything to do with God from time to time. <clears throat> but God is not willing, and his mercy will reach, and he's not willing that any should perish. <clears throat> and we're hoping and praying that God will do some marvelous work in his heart at some point. And, and I believe that he will, because nothing, even though it seems impossible, you know, we sang about that, nothing is impossible with God. He mm -hmm. will uh, provide a way, because he is a way maker. And, uh, and so nothing is impossible. Prayer accomplishes amazing results. In Jeremiah 33, 3, it says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Let's never give up in prayer. Let us not become weary in doing good. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest <clears throat> if we don't give up. Galatians tells us that in 6, verse, chapter, uh, verse 9. So we are to keep fervently praying for our loved ones and for our friends. Because God <clears throat> will use our prayers and our relationships to reach other people. Howard Hendricks, who <clears throat> was a theologian at Dallas Seminar, said, uh, Seminary, said that uh, oftentimes with Christians, you know, we, a new Christian, you know, it takes them about three years to get rid of all their unchristian friends. You know, and then you start living in a bubble, right? A, a church bubble, all right? Well, we can't connect with unbelievers if we're just staying in our bubble. So we have to get outside our bubble. We have to be able to establish friendships and connections where we work or, or, or people that we know, our friends outside the church, those that we come in contact with. So we have an opportunity to win them to the Lord, to, to have a, a, an influence on them. Uh, and, and so we want to be able to connect with others so that we can use our unique circumstances, our unique past, our experiences, and our personalities so that we can connect with others. The second point really is to be your unique self. No one shares the gospel the way you can. No one shares the gospel the way I can. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered uh, why you've been through some rough times. It's often because you can take these tough times, which produces patience, and patience, which produces character, and character, which produces hope. And we can connect and we can share that hope with others, and we can tell them, honestly, you know, I, I know what you've been going through, because a couple years ago, you know, we went through something similar to that. This is what happened to us. And this is how God took care of it. You know, somebody broke my, or somehow my, my uh, you know, my window got broke in the car, right? I guess you did that to yourself, didn't you? <laughs> but, but God took care of it. And you were able to testify that God takes care of us, right? And he provided the monies needed to fix the car. That's a testimony. That's an experience that he has that he can share. And he did. He took the opportunity to share that and to bless us with that story. Oftentimes those kind of experiences what opens up relationships with others. We tell our stories. 
So what's your past? What's your family past? What brought you to Christ? I'm a second generation Christian. It all started way back when my Uncle Al, he was a, a vet in, uh, in, in, the, in uh, World War II. He was in the Navy. He was stationed in the Mediterranean. His ship was attacked by Germans and it sunk. And he was at sea for a while. And he was thought to have been dead. They, they fished him out, sent him to a, another ship in the morgue. And, it, and then he started breathing. And, and they noticed the sheet came up. And the sheet went down. The sheet came up. He's still alive. So they moved him from the morgue. But he went, he went through all of that battle and all of those things, and he developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which really was something he carried with him forever. And, and this condition um, made him a pretty mean man. And sometimes he abused his wife. And one time he was in jail because he had abused his wife, and he was arrested. And a man by Emerson Ward, a man named Emerson Ward, he worked for child evangelism in, in Warsaw area, not far from here, and uh, he came to the jail. And he told my uncle about the Lord. And initially, my uncle made a decision. And he said, he said hey, will you go and talk to my mom and my dad and tell them about Jesus? And so... Um, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll go. And, and so he went and he talked to my, my, my mom was there. She was his younger sister. She was only 13, Linda. And, and he told her about Jesus. And Linda accepted Christ at 13. And she stayed with her faith. She didn't have a way to church because uh, her, her parents didn't, my, my grandmother didn't drive and my grandfather, to, unfortunately, to our Recollection never really made a decision for the Lord, but my grandmother did, but she never drove. So my mom had to get a ride to church with um, the neighbors, and the neighbors took her to church. And, and so that's how she started getting involved in youth group. And then she got connected with, uh, with a pastor, a, a gentleman that became a missionary. He was going through seminary, he and his wife, and, and they were the leaders of the youth group. And so mom grew up in the church that way. And, and then later she, she learned that she should have a, a Christian husband. So she prayed that someday she would meet a Christian man. And, and, and one day they go, she's at Rock Lake Skating Rink. Anybody ever go roller skating? I used to love to go roller skating. That was so much fun. And my mom met my dad at a roller rink. And, and, and they got married years, you know, a year or two later. And they've been rolling along ever since, right? And, and, and mom and dad... Uh, were involved in Youth for Christ as a young couple. And, and uh, they raised my sister and I in the church to love the Lord. I remember my mom and my dad uh, sharing me with me as I was about five, six, and, and they led me to the Lord. I'll never forget, I kneeled at, at my bed. Um, and uh, I remember the, the mattress squeaking and the sound that it made when we <laughs> kneeled down there. But that's how I got saved. Because mom and dad loved the Lord and they led me. But it all started way back with my uncle in jail. And a man going to this jail to tell him, right? That's where it all started. And I remember that my mom, one day, Emerson came to our church. And he didn't normally attend, he went somewhere else, but he was there. And so mom said, Rod, I want you to know this is Emerson. He is, the, he is the man that led me to the Lord when I was 13. So I got to meet him. I never forgot that. That was pretty powerful. And I encourage you, tell your faith stories. What has God done in you? Our individual stories and our personalities will connect with other people as we build relationships, and that's how we earn the right to share. Several weeks ago, our pastor handed out some books to us. It was um, uh, Clifton's uh, Strength-Based uh, Leadership Books. Okay, in, in his books, um, it's supposed to help us to understand who we are, who God made us, and our abilities in leadership based on our personalities. And uh, 
You know, the Bible tells us, as Psalms, David said that we are, that I will praise you for I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And my soul knows that very well. You are a marvelous person because God made you who you are. He took you and he put different circumstances into you, different opportunities. Some of them were good, some of them might not have been so good, but you are uniquely you. And there are opportunities for you to be you in the community and to connect with other people and share your story with them. Well, this book, um, at the end of it, tells, has a test, a little quiz you take. Turns out I'm a woo! And you say, what in the world's a woo? A woo is winning others over. That's what that means, okay? <laughs> winning others over. So guess what? It suggests that I might want to consider in my career of being a salesperson and being a pastor. Guess what I do? I'm a salesperson and I'm a pastor, okay? <laughs> winning others over, right? Well, I've been in the insurance business for, for over 30 years now. And when I first started, if I didn't make a sale, I was kind of discouraged, right? We've all been there. Maybe you, you, you know, you've, had, you've tried to make a sale or something. Maybe, maybe it just didn't work out. You know, and you say, well, maybe sales isn't for me. But I used to take it personally. You know, they don't like me. That's why I didn't buy from me. Or, or, or for whatever reason, you know, you know, I just didn't connect with them. And they didn't buy from me. You know, I took it personal. Then as I, as I advanced in my career, I realized, you know, it's really not about whether or not they like me or not. It was more about, did I really meet their need? Did I connect with them? Does the product I'm trying to get them to get, in this case it's insurance, maybe, maybe it was more expensive than they wanted to spend. Or, or maybe I just didn't connect as a person. It's oftentimes sales is based on trust. The same thing with Christianity. When we share our faith with someone, it's based on do they trust you? Can they trust you to tell them the truth? And I felt rejected. Sometimes people won't share their faith because it's like, well, if, if they say no, then that means I'm a bad witness. That sharing the gospel isn't up to us. God doesn't tell us that um, we have to be successful. He tells us we have to be faithful. Now we want to do the best we can, but the idea I want you to grab is be faithful, not successful. Focus on being faithful. What does God tell us to do? Sounds a little crazy, I know, but Christ tells us that he is the one that saves them, not us. And that really takes a lot of pressure off of us too, right? I've been in times when I got a letter from an insurance company that said, if you don't get your sales up, you know, you're not going to be employed here much longer. You know, that's not a good place to be, okay? Um, and then I had to really th focus. Okay, what am I doing wrong? How can I make my presentation better? That kind of thing. I get... You know, that's a lot of pressure sometimes. And managers get on us, you know, if you're working at a factory, you have to hit rate, and you got to put this out and do this, you know, and you have to get it done such a certain time. Or, or, you know, if you're in construction, you have to follow codes. You can't just willy-nilly plop things together and hope it works. You know, it's got to be done according to codes. There's standards, right? But when we share the gospel, the point is it's not up to us. It's up to God. The Holy Spirit is the one that connects. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts a person to accept Christ as their Savior and out of their sinful condition to come to the Lord. And that's what we need to do. We need to be faithful and we need to listen to God's promptings to tell us, okay, this is an opportunity I set you up for. I want you to share the gospel. Tell them your story. How did you come to the Lord? And, and sometimes, you know, it might be on a bus uh, it just might be at the grocery store. It might be at work with a coworker or with a friend, you know, playing dominoes or, or playing cards, you know, or whatever you, 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 you do to connect with other people. The point is we need to listen to God's prompting. Uh, then share the gospel and look for opportunities. And w yes, of course, we want to understand how to present the gospel and tell people, you know, that first that, you know, we're all sinners. We're all in this together. We connect there. And then we tell them, you know, this is what God 
did. He sent his only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus paid your penalty. He's your redeemer. And then you can have a new life in Christ. Would you like to ask him to be your savior? God is the one that makes the difference. It's his spirit that does it. Now, Satan uh, would have us get trapped in this whole thing of whether we're successful or not. You know, if we didn't, if they didn't say yes, then that means that, that maybe I shouldn't say anything because I don't want to, you know, to mess them up or something. You know, they're not going to listen to me anyway. You know, but we need to remember that our different personalities and who we are made in our life's experiences, those are the things that interact and connect us with other people because we are unique in our experiences. When casting seeds, Jesus tells a parable. He says in Luke chapter 8, he said, a farmer went out to sow his seeds, and when he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path that was trampled down. The birds came and, and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because it had no moisture. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up <clears throat> with it and choked out the plants. Still some fell on good, solid, good ground, and it yielded a crop, a hundred times more than it was sowed. Okay? Notice the difference in the conditions of the soil. It also speaks to the conditions of people's hearts. <clears throat> Maybe like my son-in-law, you might run into somebody who's kind of been trampled down. And their heart is hard. And they have built walls around themselves and they don't want people to come in because they don't trust people. That is that kind of illustration. Or somebody else is, is so... <clears throat> focused on, on themselves and that they don't see the need for a savior. But we still want to tell them about God's love. And then there's the one soil that is tender, the heart that is tender, and a person that is open to the gospel. Oftentimes these are younger people because they haven't been hammered by life. And they're more open to it. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So we need to be able to share to everyone that he gives us opportunities. Last year I had a college student, a college age student, come to me. She, her, she came to our church because a friend of hers asked her, one of her best friends, she said, you know, why don't you start coming to church? And so she started coming to church. And she had been raised in the church. And, but she was a cheerleader when she was in high school. And I have, you know, cheerleading, as I mentioned. And so um, she came to me one day and said, hey, I want to help you with your cheerleading program. I said, great, we'd love to have you. Because, you know, you need cheerleaders if you're going to have a cheerleading program. So you've got to have some experience there. And she did a great job, but I realized in her that she had a great leadership ability. And so it was fantastic to have her join the team, Right. And so one day I decided I'd call her, I was talking to her, I just felt prompted, and I said, so what, how are you in your relationship with God? How did you come to know the Lord? And that's how she told me. She said, hey, uh, well, my friend, uh, Caitlin, invited me, and we've been best friends in high school, and we were on the cheerleading team together. And, and uh, I said, well, do you know, you have a personal relationship with God? And she said, well, I've been kind of thinking about that, because last Sunday, Pastor Kevin was talking about that, in his sermon, and I don't really understand all those things. I'm like, well, let me tell you. And so I had an opportunity to share with her the gospel, to share with her how Christ was sent as God's son, and, and how she can have a, a connection and, a, and, and join God's family. And she said, well, you've given me a lot to think about and a lot to pray about. And I just kind of left it there, knowing that, this is what God wanted me to do. And then I called my pastor and I said, Kev, next Sunday you need to present the gospel and have an opportunity for people to get saved. And he said, okay. And I said, K uh, Kaya is ready to make a decision. And so next that Sunday then he made a presentation uh, in part of his sermon. And he asked if anyone would like to 
except Christ. And she did. That's pretty cool. That is teamwork in evangelism. You know, her friend invited her to church. I had an opportunity to tell her about Jesus' love. And Kevin had an opportunity to actually lead her to the Lord and lead her in prayer. And that's what, that's what evangelism is all about. Sometimes we're praying for people that we love and that we know and friends. Sometimes we're uh, right out there talking to people about it and telling them about our life experiences and connecting with them. No matter what age we are or who we are, we always have the goodness of God to share. And someday, sometimes, we actually are the ones that get to lead them and pray with them and they accept the Lord. Now this year, Kaya is helping me. And now, not only because I mentioned she had really good leadership skills, this year, she is the director of our cheerleaders. Okay? And this year, I pushed her a little bit because she got baptized this last summer and she's been a year growing in her faith. I pushed her a little bit. I said, how would you like to do the devotions this year with the Pee Wee kids? This is the preschool and the kindergartners, the football players and the cheerleaders. I'll have you lead that we'll give you the material and you would say yeah i'd like to do that okay so here is someone who accepted the lord last year and now this year she is going to be presenting the gospel and telling little boys and little hoppers about jesus that's what teamwork does that's how evangelism works and and you know kaya i'm excited for what she's doing and i'm excited for you know the opportunity that I had just to share with her about about God's love and what it's done in her life, and uh, for all of us, okay, for all of us, Happy Day, we have the same opportunities, you know, and 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 maybe it's at your work, maybe it's it's um, with just the the person that lives next to you, your neighbor, but we all have an opportunity, and did you know that? Statistics show that if you will invite four people, four people, if you invite four people to church, one person will say yes. That's st statistics. Isn't that amazing? That's not a whole lot of people to ask. If you invite four people to church, one person will say, yeah, I'll come. And maybe stay after them a while, but they'll come. Okay? So one out of four, that's 25%. That's not bad. You can do that, and you can bring them to a place where they can hear about Jesus' love, and they can accept Christ. And that's oftentimes what my ministry is all about. I, I, I have a football program that attracts neighbors, that attracts family, and then we tell them about Jesus. We tell the kids, and we tell the parents. And, and we do the same thing with Archery Tag, and we teach leadership as part of what we're doing with our kids and with our adults that are in our program. So I want to encourage you Invite somebody to church. Talk about your life experiences. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. That's what evangelism is all about. Don't worry about whether or not you're the one that leads them to the Lord. Just plant seeds. Just scatter your seeds. Tell your stories. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for your many blessings. We thank you that you love us so much, that, that you love me so much, Lord. You sent a man to a jail cell to tell my uncle about Jesus that led to my mom accepting Jesus and marrying my dad who loved you and raising my sister and I to love you too. But we don't know what you're going to do with our stories. We don't know how it's going to impact others, but we just want to be a part of your mission. And we want to share and love others in the name of Jesus. Help us to do that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
if it was, am I living it? Do I live in it? So astounding. Love is an ocean, you can drown me. The sweet embrace, the lovely taste, I taste the sea. I'm under grace, the place to be. It means I'll never need an umbrella. I'm cool in the cold, in the hot weather. Whether or never I ever understand I'm a man in the hands of great plans. I stand with faith down in life. I never know to touch and still I stop my clutch. But I'm like, what's the dream of? What's the hope in? What's the doubt for? Live to no end. This is living. The life I've been given is a gift. If I'm a living, I'm a living to death. So what's the dream of? What's the hope in? What's the doubt for? And live to no end. This is living. The life I've been given is a gift. If I'm a living, I'm a living to death. Yeah. From all of us at Parkview Health, have a healthy, happy holiday.
time and jingle bell time. Snowing and blowing up bushels of fun. Now the jingle hop has begun. That's the Jingle Bell.
now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Let every heart say, Amen. 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 God bless you all. Stay in the Spirit this week. Amen. Amen. Amen.